of ABC7's media partner, the San Francisco Standard, is back with another insightful report, this time on a controversial Amazon delivery hub that's being proposed. But first, new word today that a vaccine for kids under five may be approved after all within the month, maybe. This due to the return to the idea of a two-dose series, even though it was shown in trials to be not effective enough. So joining us now to talk about this and other COVID news is UCSF's Chief of Medicine, Dr. Bob Wachter. Dr. Wachter, great to have you here. Thank you, Kristen. Great to be here. All right, so before we get to the big news about the vaccines for kids, a quick big picture. Is the Omicron surge over for us? Are we now back in a comfortable place? No. <laughs> it, it's not over, but it is improving tremendously. So cases are down by about half in the Bay Area. The test positivity rate has started to fall. Hospitalizations are only down by about 10%. So if you think about the peak as being on top of a big mountain, if we were at 10,000 feet, we're probably down to 5,000. Ah. You still wouldn't want to fall off the mountain. So we've got a few weeks until we're down at the kind of low levels where we could really, uh, really relax. Gotcha. Okay. I did half dome once when I was much, much younger. So I get that analogy. Thank you very much, Dr. Walker. Yeah. Um, look, um, for parents, heads are spinning a little bit, um, you know, for those with kids under five, like six months to five years, for whom there's currently no approved vaccine in the U.S., of course. They had, right, heard that it was going to be a two-shot dose, and then it was three shots, and then today we're hearing two shots, uh, maybe back on the burner again with the FDA urging Pfizer to apply for emergency use authorization approval. So walk us through what is actually actually happening? Yeah, I think the, the real issue is not that anybody thinks it's going to be a two-shot regimen. The idea is that, um, that they are thinking about approving the two shots now, so you get your two shots into your kid now while we await the final data on the third shot. So the, the bottom line is, you know, because of the, the uh, little kids, they had to use smaller doses and you kind of take a guess as to what you think the right dose is. And they went to a dose that's, uh, that's quite small. And it turned out when they looked at it, the amount of antibodies you got from those two doses wasn't as high as we'd seen in older kids or in adults. And so they kind of went back to the drawing board and said, all right, it's clear that we need a third dose. Mm -hmm. So that is the plan. They're studying now. They're studying a third dose. It's going to take a few mo more months for those studies to be done. And the debate today is about whether the FDA, based on the information they have so far, whether there were any signals that two doses work partly and are completely safe. And if they are, I think they're thinking if we approve this now, at least parents can get started on vaccinating their kids get them their first two doses while we await the information about the third dose. But I think the end game here is almost certainly going to be a three dose vaccine. If you wait until the, the studies are done on three doses and you don't get started even with the first dose uh, until let's say, you know, May or June, that delays things by two, three, four extra months. So that's the thinking. It's complicated, but uh, I, you know, to me, I think the big question is going to be when they look at what they saw with the first two doses, was there any evidence that it was helpful in terms of antibodies or preventing infections, even if you know it's not going to be ultimately the final dose? Got it. And in answering that question, whether the two dose was effective, um, wasn't there some evidence that it was for the younger, younger kids, like six months to two years, but maybe less so for the two to fours? Exactly right. So, yeah, for the six months to two years, they did seem to have a pretty good antibody response, but for the two years to five years, they had less of a good antibody response. And so they basically said, let's go back and, and it's clear that we need more of a dose for those older kids. I doubt they'll approve it for the, the six month to two year range. I think if they do go forward, it will because because they look through all the data and say it looks perfectly safe in kids six months to, to five years. And there's enough evidence of some benefit, even though it's partial benefit, that and 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 the vaccines were completely safe in these young kids, that we believe that the third third dose will be helpful and get us to a point where the kids are really nicely vaccinated. There's no harm in getting started early. And what it would do, of course, is accelerate if ultimately you need three doses and you get started next month mm. versus get started in April or May you know, your kid will get vaccinated two or three months sooner, and that will prevent many, many thousands of infections. I wonder 
why that wasn't the thinking when the two dose trial results kind of first came out and they said, oh, it's not as effective as we had hoped, the Pfizer trials. Um, is it prompted by the Omicron surge that the FDA is like, let's let's just go ahead with the two shots now? Yeah, I think partly that and partly it shows a little bit of flexibility. Why wasn't it considered? Because yeah. it's not the usual way the FDA does its business. It, it says we need to have we need to know the complete regimen and how many doses and look at that and look at the trials and then approve it or not approve it based on that. I think they're, you know, they're looking at what is, I think, ultimately a more practical approach. You know, it sounds stupid, but is obviously self-evidently true. You can't give dose three until you've given doses right. one and two. Right. And so, yeah. and so if we know doses one and two are helpful, not as helpful as we want, but are helpful and are completely safe, I think they just started thinking more about it. And yes, of course, in the context of a huge number of infections, particularly of young kids, because they're the only group, I guess they're immunosuppressed people, but if you look at all our entire population, it's the only group at this point that can't be vaccinated. Right. Everyone else who's not vaccinated mostly has made a choice not to be vaccinated. And of course, if you're the parent of a young kid, you're probably quite anxious because you see infections being prevented in many other groups, including older kids who've been vaccinated, but the young kids are having disproportionate numbers of infections with Omicron. So I think it prompted them to think harder about it. Okay. Uh, it seems before we came on air, the FDA set a meeting for February 15th, correct me if I'm wrong, to consider Pfizer's application right. here. Um, so if that's the case, when do you think the two dose could be approved and, and given out to kids for a shot? Well, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I think the issue for I've spoken to a couple of the members of the committee, but the issue for February 15th is, is there any good evidence that the two doses help? I think if there's no evidence that it helps uh, approving it just on the hope that those three will be the magic formula. I think that's that's unlikely to happen. So if they do see that there's evidence that it helps and again, no evidence there's any harm, it seems quite safe in the little kids. Mm -hmm. uh, then if they approve it, it'd probably be rolling out end of February, very beginning of March to forget you to get your first dose. But but you should think about it as a three dose regimen. You almost certainly will need to get three doses by the time everything's done. Is it a no brainer to you that kids in this group should get it? as soon as the vaccine is approved for them? I would if I was the parent of a little kid based on what we know about the safety of the vaccines, the risk of Omicron in unvaccinated kids, and the possibility that some of these kids will have long-term uh, complications of their COVID. So, and, but I'm basing that in part on the fact that I see the vaccines as nearly perfectly safe you know, obviously some some kids will have reactions, but what we've seen in 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 other groups of kids, even the scare that you heard about cardiac complications of vaccinations, first of all, tend to be in much older kids. And second of all, have almost always been mild. Very few have led to hospitalizations, whereas we see a fair number of kids getting sick, not a ton, but enough getting sick that if we're me, if there's evidence that you do get a, a, an, an immune response to the two doses, I'm quite confident that three doses are going to do the trick. If you said to me, you can get it now or wait three or four months to get dose number one, which means you're going to wait six months or so until you have three doses in your kid, I would probably choose to get it now with my kid. Mm -hmm. Okay. One mom I talked to wants to know um, what are the side effects that we've seen in the trials um, for those under five? Like any myocarditis at all? Any other side effects? I the don't event? think so. It's a good It's a good question that it will be in large part what the FDA is reviewing. Because they, they, of course, if there's any evidence that the kids are having uh, significant numbers of adverse effects, mm -hmm then you know with it's it's sort of rule 1 with vaccines do no harm you're talking about giving uh, giving something to people that are healthy so you your threshold has to be incredibly low and at least from what i've seen and heard so far there doesn't seem to be the myocarditis problem that was seen in older and teenagers mostly boys even in that group you know 1 in 20,000 mild almost no hospitalizations but not seen in the little kids as far as as far as i know if there's any concerns about safety that they I'm sure the FDA will kick this one down the road but at least from what I've heard so far there really have not been okay and the same mom also wants to know can you rule out the possibility of any long-term effects uh, be it fertility issues or anything else with regard to her very young one getting a vaccine 
Can I, you can't, can I rule out the possibility? No, but it's not been seen now in vaccines used in hundreds of millions of people and billions of people around the world. There's not been any reported cases of long-term effects of vaccination for other vaccines that weren't seen in the first couple of months. And again, if it were my kid and you asked me the question, are you worried about long-term complications? I would say yes from COVID. Far, 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 far more than I am about long-term complications from a vaccine. I don't think we know that that you know that a, a kid who has even a mild case of COVID will not have some consequence of that infection years out. I don't want to scare people because I think if it happens, it's got to be very rare. But that would be what I'd be more worried about than a long-term complication of about a va from a vaccination. All right, Dr. Bob Wachter, do not go away. When we come back, let's talk about the lifting of the mask mandate in some places here in the Bay Area uh, and whether we are approaching endemic stage. Take it over to Facebook Live right now where Dr. Wachter will be answering your questions. All right, Dr. Wachter, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you staying with us for two blocks of our show today. Um, you know, okay. I've been wondering how vaccinated or unvaccinated are we as a whole now in the U.S.? Are we still at like 70%-ish? I think we're up to, uh, the last I looked, 65% or, or so uh, have had uh, two shots. 75% or so have had one shot and 30 to 40% or so have had three shots. The problem with that is I don't see, I don't consider you to be fully vaccinated unless you've had three shots. Now, if you have, you've had two shots and a breakthrough infection, you're probably about the equivalent of having had three shots. So, it, 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 but you know, the people who got two shots and particularly the people who got one shot it's probably better than nothing, but only a little bit better than nothing. They should get three shots. So I wonder if you find it surprising that, you know, a lot of people who got two shots don't want the third shot, because presumably if you are not worried about the vaccine's effect on you and you think, OK, I'm not scared of it. It's good for me. I'll get it. What is the resistance, you think, to the third shot? Or is it not resistance? Is it maybe confidence that two shots will do great for you? Yeah, I, I actually tweeted that this morning because I, I said I'm I'm actually in some ways more surprised by people who have not gotten the booster than by, uh, you know, I'm still flummoxed that people would not be vaccinated. The evidence that of benefit is so remarkably clear. You're 100 times likelier to die of COVID if you're if you had three shots and if you're unvaccinated. Wow. But the benefit of, of the booster is also quite clear. Um, and so. Yeah, I'm kind of like you, like someone who got two shots, who's made the statement, I'm willing to be vaccinated and understood the benefits of vaccination and went ahead and did that, who's chosen not to take a third shot. I don't quite get it. I'm assuming some of them got infected and have and think and have been told maybe that uh, makes that's sense. kind of the All right, equivalent Dr. Walker, of booster. We're coming back on TV, so I'm going to yeah. ask you to pause for a second because we're coming back. Sure. All right, we are back with Dr. Bob Wachter, the chair of UCSF's Department of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Wachter, we have some new data just out that shows just how effective the vaccine, and even better, the Vaccine Plus booster, have been against hospitalizations during Omicron, right? Can you give us those numbers? Yeah, I, mean, I, I tend to think of this as multiples of 10, that if you compare someone, if, if you're unvaccinated versus someone who's had three shots, you're, you have 100 times lower probability of getting very sick, going to the hospital and dying. So the, so uh, someone who's fully boosted, 100, 100 times lower. A booster versus two shots is about 10 times lower. Maybe it's seven or eight, but it's an easy number to remember that going from from your second shot to your third, about a 10 times lower chance of a bad, a bad outcome. Going from nothing to three shots, about 100 times lower of a bad outcome. So people who've had three shots really are tremendously safe, particularly with Omicron, since it's a little bit milder. But, you know, a tremendous, a, a very large advantage if you go from two shots to three as well. I was going to say, folks, you do the math, but Dr. Walker has done the math for you. So uh, make your decisions uh, based on that. Randy has a question for you. He wants to know, can Dr. Walker elaborate on risks of the variant BA2? Uh, has our thinking changed on that? Yeah, a little bit. So this is a sub-variant of Omicron. It's a few more mutations in Omicron. And it's a little scary, not so much because the variant itself is scary, but because, you know, you're hearing all of us say, well, we're probably entering an endemic state, but it could change if there's another curveball, the curveball being a new variant. 
this is not the one that's going to change it markedly. We What we know so far about this variant is it does not appear to be more severe than regular Omicron. It does not appear to evade the immune system, either immune system from vaccines or from your infection, any better than the original Omicron. It does appear to be a little bit more infectious, which is amazing because Omicron was amazingly infectious. So it's a little bit better at Omicron that, that, at, at infecting people. We know that because in certain countries it's, it's taking over for the original Omicron. Mm. And what that might mean is in the Bay Area, for example, if it takes off here, rather than coming down the curve like that, it might be that it slows down our uh, our exit from, from the surge. But it shouldn't fundamentally change our ability to get out of the surge because it's not ev evading the immunity any better than Omicron did. All right. Um, today, as you know, San Francisco lifted its indoor mask mandate for stable cohorts uh, where people are vaccinated. So we're talking about gyms, offices, you know who's coming in and you know their vaccination status. Um, will you unmask in those situations? Do you feel comfortable? Uh, not quite yet. Um, and I think it's it's vaccinated and boosted. So so that to me is key. Again, I don't consider you to be fully vaccinated, whatever the CDC says. Mm -hmm. I don't consider you to be fully vaccinated if you haven't gotten three shots. So if it, the reason I wouldn't I wouldn't do that yet is the cases are still quite high and they're coming down very rapidly. And there's nothing I need to do in indoor spaces in the next two weeks that I can't wait a couple weeks for. So if you tell them in a two, three weeks when the cases come down to a much lower level and they're descending pretty quickly, mm -hmm. then, yeah, I'd be perfectly comfortable with that. I think if you're in a group that you know and is stable and everybody's had three shots and you know that if somebody felt crummy that morning, they would stay home and get a test, mm -hmm. uh, then I'd feel comfortable being in an indoor space unmasked. But I think the cases are still a little bit high to do that. Um, maybe if I was younger, I, I, I might, I'm old enough to be, uh, to feel still a little bit vulnerable. I'm okay. going to wait two or three weeks until I do that. So do you think California will be in a position to drop the mask mandate when it expires February 15th, or do you think maybe it should be renewed? Uh, that's a close call. I think that's sort of right around the date that you'd be thinking about it and whether it's February 15th or you wait another week or so. I think that's about the time where hopefully enough people will have immunity, hopefully most from vaccines, some from some from infection, that the case rates will come down as if they continue to come down. I think it's plus or minus a week. So, you know, since since the messaging is tricky here, uh, I think we'll probably be in an okay position to do it on February 15th. I think if, if to be a little safe, I think March 1st would be a little bit safer given that um, uh, it's, it may not be down as low as we want it by February 15th, but, but pretty close. Okay. Carol wants to know, would you recommend a vaccine for a child with a genetic disorder and autism? Well, the autism should have not much to do with it. It shouldn't, it, it, it shouldn't put you at much greater risk for an infection. It doesn't put you at any greater risk for a reaction to the, uh, uh, to the vaccine. The myth of other vaccines that they cause autism has been debunked uh, up and down. So I'm not worried about vaccines and kids with autism. So I would treat a kid with autism. I actually have a kid with autism. I would treat a kid with autism as being like just everyone else in terms of yeah. the risk and the benefit of the vaccination. Okay. No need for different rules. Um, uh, Denmark and Norway just announced they're basically removing all restrictions, signaling that they are moving into endemic mode uh, or they want to. Are we there yet, uh, b both from a psychological standpoint, which I think we are, but what about the scientific standpoint? Well, the psychological standpoint is interesting. I don't think that's a slam dunk. I think, you know, the, the point that's been made recently is, is that for many people that have taken this pandemic very seriously, sort of getting your mind to really understand that the risks, not quite yet, but in a couple of weeks, will be very low for people who've had three shots. That's a hard thing to get your mind around when it's been pickled with anxiety for a couple of years. So it will take a little while for all of us to get to get used to it. I don't think we're quite there. I mean, the same answer as before. I think the cases are too high. There's still too much virus around in the community. But if the curves continue in the direction they're going in, I think by the end of February, we will be in a position where we can say it's safe to be in indoor spaces. It's safe to have no masks on. If you're not vaccinated, it is not safe, but you've made that choice. I think it's a bad choice. Uh, but asking people who are fully vaccinated to be more careful in order to protect people who've made the choice not to be vaccinated at some point is not rational. And, and even for people that are immunosuppressed, 
their ability to, they can wear an N95 and they will be quite safe. There's a monoclonal antibody cocktail that they can now take that lowers their risk. They are eligible for the Pfizer drug, Paxlovid, if they get infected, that markedly lowers their risk of hospitalization. So I think we're in a world where if you're not safe, you've either made the choice not to be safe, or if you're immunosuppressed, you can do things that make things relatively safe for you. All right, Dr. Bob Wachter, always great talking with you and getting your take on things. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. All right, coming up next, we're going to talk to the San Francisco Standard about an Amazon delivery hub that is being proposed in the city. Why that's controversial when we come back. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Um, take a look at this gorgeous shot of San Francisco. So nice. We do have some high winds, which uh, meteorologist Mike Nico would tell us about on the 4 o'clock news. Um, but go ahead and enjoy the beauty. ABC7 is excited about our partnership with the brand new San Francisco Standard. Part of building a better Bay Area is highlighting those who are working toward the same mission we have here at ABC7. The Standard's deep and insightful reporting on the city does just that. And today we're talking about an agreement between Mayor London Breed's office and Amazon to begin negotiating the terms for a proposed delivery hub. It's expected to face stiff opposition from labor unions and neighborhood groups. So joining us now to talk about the agreement and what it means for the city is San Francisco Standard Editor-in-Chief, Jonathan Weber. Jonathan, good to have you here. Thank you, Kristen. Nice to be here. All right, so you discovered this agreement between Mayor Breed's office and Amazon through a public records request. It was actually signed back in September, but some top city officials say they're just learning about it now. In your reporting, you say they're angry. Who is angry and why? Uh, well, Aaron Peskin, uh, Supervisor, Supervisor Aaron Peskin, is uh, upset because he thinks the mayor's office should have been more transparent about their working with, with Amazon on this project. Uh, Supervisor Shimon Walton is upset because he has doubts about uh, whether that facility is a good one for the neighborhood, and he's also concerned about the lack of uh, public input at the early stages of the process. So I think the upset has to do with the uh, mayor's office moving ahead with this memorandum of understanding uh, without letting anyone know about it. All right. So do they welcome or not welcome the, I guess, 500 jobs promised by Amazon as part of this delivery hub? Well, I think there's some skepticism about, uh, first of all, the quality of those jobs. Uh, Amazon is, does not pay all that well. Uh, not all those jobs are full-time jobs. And then, uh, most importantly, the labor unions, uh, which have a lot of clout here in San Francisco, uh, they are antagonistic to Amazon, which is a very uh, anti-union company. Mm -hmm. uh, so I anticipate there'll be a big fight about that, about the unions wanting uh, the city to require that that facility be a union shop. And uh, Amazon is unlikely to agree to that.
So that it might well be a, a kind of a showdown. Right. The Amazon union kind of battle has been played out in different cities throughout the country uh, and it's ongoing. So what are they telling you in terms of how they plan to fight it, I guess, um, the unions? Uh, well, the unions are not saying much, actually, about their specific tactics. Uh, they haven't even officially come out and said anything one way or the other about how they're going to uh, respond to this facility. So it, 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 there are a lot of tactical and strategic questions for the unions about how they go after Amazon. And so for the moment, they're playing their cards close to the vest. But I do anticipate that they will go pretty hard at this. Okay. Now, is this type of agreement you were talking about, the MOU, uh, typical? And, and I guess staying quiet at this stage, is that typical? I'm sorry, Kristen, I, I, I missed your last Oh, uh, that's okay. Question. I know tech problems, right? Uh, the MOU, um, the agreement, um, and it being kind of, I don't want to say secretive, but, you know, on the quiet side in this early stage, is that typical or is that kind of a deal agreement not typical? Uh, well, the, the, the MOU is, is typical or fairly typical in itself in that the city is just saying, we will work with you to develop a project that we think will be in the interest of the city. And so it's normal for the city to work with companies on those kinds of things. Uh, I think it's not so normal for an MOU like this to be uh, kind of on the quiet, on the QT. Uh, I think that's less uh, usual. I mean, I think in many situations the project would not be controversial so that it would be less of an issue anyway. Ah. Uh, but, but I do think that, you know, it's a little bit odd for the mayor's office to have proceeded in exactly this fashion. So the mayor's office of economic and workforce development, they're the negotiating party, I guess, responsible on behalf of the city. Have you reached out to them? What are they telling you? Yeah, they, they did not respond to our request for comment, so they have not really said anything one way or the other. All right. Well, um, I do appreciate you updating us, Jonathan, about the story. Very interesting. And keep us posted, if you will, as it develops. Okay. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. We have links to the San Francisco Standard's other original reporting on our website, abc7news.com. And to watch more of their videos, check out our ABC7 Bay Area streaming TV app. And we'll be right back. All right, everybody, let's see what our awesome director is pulling up for us this time. I always enjoy these beauty shots while I take a sip of water. So what do you want? Tell me what you want. All right, director's choice. Wind, San Francisco. Thanks so much for joining us on this interactive show, Getting Answers. We answer your questions today about vaccines for children under five. 
whether or not California is ready to unmask indoors, and a controversial proposal for development from Amazon in San Francisco. We'll be here every weekday at 3 on air and on live stream answering your questions. World News Tonight is coming up next, and I'll see you back here at 4.